So my name is Ashley Smith. I'm a reporter with Inside Higher Ed, and I am joined this morning by these wonderful three people here who are doing very unique things uh, when it comes to uh, building uh, student skills and, and, and employee skills in the workplace. Um, I'm joined by Marianne Pacelli. Did I say that correct? Yes. Okay. She's the Workforce Development Manager with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, Walter Singenthaler? Yeah. He's Executive Vice President of the Dateweiler Corporation. And Leah Gillum, she is Vice President of Strategy, Innovation, and Education with Girls Who Code. Um, and so I will start with Marianne. If you don't mind just sort of giving us an idea of, of what you do, and, and I understand that you help small companies uh, with, with this type of issue, if you want to start there. Right. Um, I'm with the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, which is part of NIST. Uh, the MEP system has been around about 28 years, and our focus is working with small, mid-sized manufacturers across the country. So we, at the national level, fund cooperative agreements, uh, one center at least in every state, who uh, is out there to reach out to small, mid-sized manufacturers, and I help them identify what their challenges might be, uh, not, not specifically workforce, but across all of their business challenges. And then help them find the resources, whether it's uh, connecting them uh, as an intermediary to uh, the universities or the educational system, or doing some hands-on consulting with helping them look at their business, what are their growth issues, what are their technology issues, uh, what are their process and innovation uh, challenges, and how can the MEP network through the networks of uh, the institutes and the labs and national federal labs across the country, help these companies innovate and grow. So from the workforce perspective, our centers, uh, as even was highlighted in our panel previous, uh, uh, we all, all of our manufacturers are challenged with uh, growth, uh, accessing technology, new product development, exporting, all of those wonderful things, but one of the number one challenges that they all are facing right now is developing uh, the future workforce, the current and future workforce, in order to help them grow. And our small mid-sized manufacturers are the ones who are going to grow the most, uh, and it's a challenge for them because they are resource constrained. So our centers are out there trying to figure out how do we help those companies with that workforce challenge. And Walter, why don't you tell us about uh, some of the partnerships that you've built? Uh, we are a small manufacturer with 75 people, so obviously we have a, a challenge to form something big. So 20 years ago, we actually formed a partnership called Apprenticeship 2000 with other companies in our area uh, to really promote apprenticeships or get, get a promo, uh, pr an apprenticeship program going. Uh, over the 20 years, as a partnership, we have graduated 128 uh, apprentices and have, I think, something like 54 of them in the program right now. Uh, really, the main reason we did it as a partnership is because we alone could not have done it. And especially with the academic part of it, we work together with Central Piedmont Community College in Charlotte. And they would not do anything because as that while we have one or two apprentices per year and obviously they couldn't do anything special. So as a partnership, we get enough uh, mass going so we can actually fill a whole class. Typically, uh, Central Community, uh, a community college needs at least 10, 12 students in a class to be able to do something special. Uh, Central Piedmont does some special classes. They run classes specifically just for us. And so there's a lot of communication, a lot of coordination which has to go on. When we started, uh, CPCC already offered a lot of the classes we have, we needed, but one of them on Monday, another one on Tuesday, two on Thursday or whatever. And so we had to teach them to say, hey, our apprentices need to have all their classes in one day because we only want to send them to school one day because we need to train them hands on the other days. So that it takes, it takes a lot of work, but uh, in, a, in a larger group, this is possible. <clears throat> our program, we start our apprentices as seniors in high school. So the first year, they have to go to high school, of course. They have to finish high school. So they to go to high school half a day, work at the company the other half of the day. And then <clears throat> after they graduate from high school, it's three more years where they go to school at uh, the community college for one day a week and work at the shop for four days a week. <clears throat> they end up with an associate's degree in mechatronics 
and of course the German, German, uh, journeyman uh, certificate from the state. So uh, it works very well for us, and it's really it's a copy, kind of a copy of the European uh, uh, <coughs> program. We are a Swiss company. Uh, another par partner company is based in Austria, uh, in Austria uh, and other ones in Germany. So we pulled really things together from the different parts to create the program very similar to what has been very successful over in, in uh, Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. Uh, Austria. So <coughs> it, I said it works for us. And we have, in the meantime, in North Carolina expanded uh, we have helped to get other programs started. So we have in North Carolina seven programs like that uh, in different areas which we have supported to get going. Okay. And Leah, why don't you tell us about uh, Girls Who Code? Sure, thanks. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Girls Who Code is a four-year-old national organization. Our focus is really on closing the achievement and gender gap in technology and computing fields. We have two free programs that we run nationally. Um, and I think what's most relevant for the discussion today is the work that we do through our summer immersion program. And through that program, we create classrooms of 20 young women with two teaching assistants, two uh, teachers, and we bend those classrooms in technology companies and in institutions of higher education. And our focus there is to do a seven-week intensive um, computer science course, really to try and create this intervention that helps girls to really understand um, the sort of essential fundamental ideas of computer science, also of computational thinking, problem solving, um, loops, algorithms, all the kind of technical stuff. And then also, you know, by having these classrooms embedded in technology companies, we work with the corporate partners um, to really help them see and develop the young talent that's so important to really um, widen uh, the and change the, the kind of pipeline issue that we have in terms of technology fields. And then we um, will work with the with the corporate partners to bring in mentors, to have field trips, to really think about what it means to embed a classroom of young women and to begin to understand what their needs are, what their ideas are, and to really begin to see um, the real difference that a more diverse and inclusive workforce can make in their, um, in, in, in their workplace. We really see these corporate partners as kind of key to the work that we do, um, and they subsequently see us as a big part of that work as well. So, you know, the, the the classrooms that we have at Twitter, they'll sort of talk about like how are our how are our girls doing at Twitter. So we really see that you know when you have girls who are in coming into a company you know for for seven weeks in the summer that you sort of begin that sort of the two cultures begin to get a sense of how how one and the other works. And for the young women, it becomes really essential for them to get a sense of you know what it looks like to actually apply the kinds of skills that they're learning into technology companies and in the computing field. We don't imagine that every young woman is going to go into a technology field. But just in terms of the way, um, you know, we see computer science and computational thinking, you know, as essentially the new liberal arts. It's something that underlies so many of the different aspects of the of our of our uh, culture and of our business economy. So we see this as a really kind of essential essential piece of our um, of our work. We have a we have a national after school program. Um, that is much more kind of akin to a club structure. Uh, that's a little bit more community sort of based and community grown. Um, but the summer immersion program um, is just launching. The DC area programs just launched um, last Monday. So we're super excited. We'll be working with over 1,500 girls this summer. Wow. So what are some of the, the uh, skills gaps or some of the issues that the partners that you're working with, what are they looking for uh, when they come to you? Well, from the, uh, the MEP perspective, our centers are working with small, mid-sized companies on a regular basis. And um, it, it, the skills gap, it, there's a lot written up out there right now trying to define it. But the struggle, and it was brought up in our last panel too, is uh, the numbers of young people that are our best and our brightest are not necessarily choosing manufacturing and technical fields as their uh, choice of work. So part of it is trying to uh, encourage and, and re-advertise and republicize and create the, 
the great community of why, uh, what are the jobs, what are the careers available to you after high school, whether you move on to a one or two year uh, certificate at a community college and or want to move on to a four year degree, um, we, we are seeing how do we help build that future pipeline. Uh, many of the uh, young people that are moving um, out of high school are right away moving into college or moving into the service sector and, and aren't even aware of what is available. Our manufacturers today at the frontline level are looking for people who want to work there and can train and can learn the job. And so technical skills today in a frontline manufacturing job, whether it's entry level or moving up into what we call the middle skills level, such as mechatronics, um, you need a real strong high school STEM education. Liberal arts core, you, be, being able to read, write, communicate, um, being, being able to do basic problem solving, understanding math, uh, being able to learn higher order thinking and learn some of the computer skills after high school that you need. Uh, those are skills that uh, we want. Many of those young people are not necessarily knocking on the doors of our small manufacturers. So our challenge first is trying to figure out how to get some of those students to strongly consider those jobs. Well, uh, just loading right onto that, we obviously we have a problem. Uh, awareness of a high school is not there, what manufacturing has to offer. We are putting in a lot of effort. It's basically a full year cycle where we do the re recruiting. We invite career counselors, to come in, offer them a luncheon so they keep them happy, and of course uh, introduce them to the program. Also give them a plan tour. It's very, very important that they see what's going on, what today's manufacturing is, because there's still a lot of uh, misconceptions about manufacturing, the 3Ds, dirty, dangerous, and, and dark. Uh, they're still out there, and that's not what today's manufacturing is anymore. But then, Really, with the, with the counselors, we inform them and tell them what we are looking for. We are looking for really smart pe young people, but the ones who like to work with their hands. And they are out there, but we have to find them. So the career counselors then, in some schools it works better than in other ones, they go back and select some of their potential students. We then go to the high school, give a presentation to show them what is going on. And usually we take one of our apprentices with them because if an old guy like me stands in front of 15, 16 year old kids, that just doesn't work very well. So we bring the juniors with us and uh, show them what's happening. If they're interested, then they can come to an open house. Uh, one condition we have with the open house is that they have to bring a parent or legal guardian with them because we want to get them right involved because a lot of the parents have misconceptions about apprenticeships, about uh, manufacturing and so on. So it's important, and again, part of the open house, of course, is the presentation of the program as well as a plan tour. So they see what that is. Out of that, we, whoever is still interested, we have uh, a, a, what we call orientation. That's four evenings after school. That's typically in February. When after school they come in, they work for, we work a project with them for about three, four hours, so they get some hands-on work done, so they, they see, okay, is this really what I like? And of course we see, is this student really capable of doing things like that? And then what we have ongoing right now is the last step, that's a six-week internship, it's paid, uh, during the summer between the junior year and senior year, and out of that group we pick who is getting into the apprenticeship program. So it's very selective, but I don't have any qualms being selective because we are investing a lot of money into those young people, so any scholarship of $150,000 is also selective, so I don't have a problem doing that. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, I, th I think certainly it is definitely an issue of awareness. I really agree, and then, um, you know, as I said before, it's really also this issue of, of, of this real gap in achievement. We really know from the research that um, there are certain groups because of historical and institutional um, uh, barriers really have had a hard time understanding what the sort of possibilities are when it comes to working with technology, whether that's manufacturing or whether, or whether that's um, 
uh, more you know kind of computational computer science fields the way that um, that Girls Who Code is sort of has has thought about initially. What we're really finding though is that through our clubs program, um, we, there are a range of different companies and local efforts that really help our young women begin to understand the range of roles that they can use that they can and roles roles and professions that they can explore. So we're really finding that you know although initially our organization focused on um, you know sort of eleven specific cities. Austin, Atlanta, um, uh, New York, the Bay Area, you know, sort of 11, you know, kind of key markets um, that as we continue to expand and really see, you know, what are the opportunities that are available for the young women that we've worked with, many of whom, you know, who are in junior high or in high school, we're really increasingly looking to smaller businesses, you know, to local uh, manufacturing as well to really help think about who can actually see the kinds of skills and the kinds of opportunities um, that are available to a wide range of people across the United States. So um, we are really thinking specifically about what are those ways that we can build awareness so that young women have a sense of the kinds of opportunities that are available you know, in their neighborhood or in their area. So we're working you know, very concretely with our clubs program this year to really think about how we begin to help young women see what those opportunities are. So our clubs program is in 42 states um, right now and we have over 460 clubs um, across 42 states. So that to us opens up a really interesting kind of opportunity to begin to think, okay, if you're not at Facebook, if you're not at you know, Lockheed Martin, what are the other ways that you can use the kinds of skills that you're, you're learning through Girls Who Code and what are those, what are those future opportunities? You're talking about expansion. I'm just wondering for, for Marianne and Walter, um, are you all looking at broadening to other companies to, to expand your apprenticeship programs at all to, to raise awareness in that way? Um, through the, the MEP, the, the each center, uh, each state, you know, kind of works in their own region. And, and some things that were mentioned in um, the previous panel about really needing to be a community. What we're encouraging, what our centers are trying to encourage is getting programs like an Apprenticeship 2000, whether it's apprenticeship focus or just skills and certification focus, how do we get like companies, to, companies that have like needs together in a small region where just like a small company, as you mentioned, you don't have the horsepower to go knock on a school's door and say, hey, customize an entire program for me. I have three people that I need to be trained. I'll close the door. So how do we get four or five of those companies together to do some very specific skills training, whether it's for new employees working with the workforce system, finding some of those new employees that we need to hire, or even upskilling the existing workforce that I have. I've hired some entry-level people. I've changed my technology. I now have to move this level of people into a new technology, new operation system, or I have to grow my own maintenance people because they're not on the street. So how do we combine a few companies together, work with the educational system, create boot camps, long-term certificate programs that are working in that particular community, and perhaps find some national funding or some local funding to help offset that where possible. But companies have to put some of their own investment into it also and really develop their local regional workforce themselves. So our centers are working as intermediaries in most cases, working with the educational system, groups of small companies, and on a regular basis, customizing the programs that they need, and then working to continue to fill that pipeline. How do we get more small companies to open their doors to uh, student tours? Uh, MEP was one of the founding partners of Manufacturing Day, October uh, 1st this year, uh, or October 7th this year coming up. But we look at every day should be Manufacturing Day. But what are those, how do we get more and more companies to think about how do they market themselves to the community as we are a viable entity in your community and we want you, your, you know, we want the individuals in that community to consider working for us. Uh, the networking of the community of smaller manufacturers in each area is really something that has to grow much stronger. On our end, we, you know, besides what I had mentioned before about uh, recruiting, we also do a lot of uh, just shop tours. Or Charlotte Mecklenburg School District has a really interesting program which we have participated in over the last three years. It's called STEMmersion. They take teachers who 
teach in the STEM curriculum during the summer for two weeks, and they move them every day to another company. So they spend a day at different companies to see what's going on. And it's amazing to hear the comments when we get them out on the shop and we, we bring them out to the machines and they actually, we let them operate some of the machines and we work a project with them. At the end, they have to, they get a box of parts and they have to assemble a little pen holder and, and so on. And, but some of the comments were, I had no idea that math is needed on a milling machine. Because I have to say, where would they know from if they don't have that opportunity? So I think it's very important that we as manufacturers really open our door and educate the people. Uh, I'm spending a lot of time uh, going around and, well, that's also why I'm sitting here, I guess. <laughs> but uh, especially in North Carolina, I'm, I'm the, well, uh, also for a few days ago, I'm not anymore the chairman of the, but I was for the last 10 years the chairman of the North Carolina Apprenticeship Council, I'm still a member of the council, and uh, that's where we helped through part of it through the council, part of it through just connections with friends or what. If we know, know of somebody that is interested, we help them to support how to set up a program. And I'm doing quite a bit of that also over the phone. I'll have a phone conversation with a company in Connecticut tomorrow because they're interested and they like to know how we do it just to learn. And I think. Our, I, I, can, I, I feel our program is really working. I'm not saying that's the only way of doing it, but that's one way of doing it. And so we are very supportive. Yeah, we could say, hey, we got our program. We are happy, mm -hmm. so why should I tell anybody? But we believe that apprenticeships are very, very important for the future of manufacturing, and that's why we put so much effort into it. I think there's an interesting kind of call to action um, that's developing here. I'm um, really thinking about what are the ways that you market your companies, market your opportunities in unique ways so that people actually get a real sense of what it of what the work looks like. And we think about that a lot and we talk about that a lot at Girls Who Code because there's, you know, when you talk about computer science, when you talk about technology fields, everyone sort of imagines the Mark Zuckerberg sort of, you know, someone in a basement in a, you know, in a hoodie who hasn't seen the light of day in five years, um, who's just coding night and day and you and people really, you you know, don't have a sense that you know that actually coding is really collaborative work, and working computationally can be um, can call on a number of different skills. And I think it's really a very similar thing when you think about the manufacturing skills, so the manu manufacturing um, uh, kind of industry as well. So I love these examples where you're really sort of thinking about what are ways that you create kind of hands-on, you know, real-time experiences for. Um, you know, young people for for underskilled workers to really begin to understand what does this work look like. Um, so yeah, find a Girls Who Code club in your in your uh, region and see if you can um, you know create create some kind of experience with them. Field trips, hackathons, boot camps, all those things are really great ways to bring in new audiences and have them just experiment and understand what these things look like. Because I think there's a way in which, obviously, in such a digitally sort of focused um, culture, we really forget right, that you can work with your hands, that it draws on math and STEM and all of these other you know, kind of um, uh, areas of specialty. And so I think that's, I, I'm really excited by these sort of ideas. And I think it's sort of a great, it's a great kind of call to action to all of us to really think about how do you give real kind mm -hmm. of hands-on experiences so people begin to understand what this work looks like. The interesting thing is that you all have talked about how um, unprepared students are when they come to you or, or when they, they enter the apprenticeships or when they come to Girls Who Code. And I wonder if maybe you all can just kind of talk about um, the role that outside companies are playing by basically stepping into where the education space may have failed. Um, it seems as if you all have answered a call here to go in and, and fill in the gaps of, of where maybe a high school education didn't really help or didn't prepare. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. I think one, one thing that we've really found um, with Girls Who Code, and increasingly um, that although we are working with companies, it's, it's really the individuals and the companies that are really stepping forward. Um, so right now, we see that there are you know, individual engineers who will come into a classroom and, or you know, devote time and mentor. Um, there are you know individual people who will come in and sort of talk about their will talk about their experience, but you know to me the real sort of like warriors in our story are the 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 local volunteers who are running Girls Who Code clubs. So you know four to to eight hours a week, 
um, you know, in running an after school club, coming from, uh, from coming from their you know day to day jobs. Some of them are teachers. Some of them work in in industry. Some of them work in technology fields. This is unpaid you know labor. They're volunteering to really mentor and help um, a group of young women to really understand the computing field um, and to understand technology. Increasingly, um, we're really finding that um, the, you don't have to have a specialized computer science background to really facilitate this kind of work. And so we're increasingly really thinking about what are those kinds of relationships, what are those, what is the sort of volunteer mechanism in which you're able to invite more individuals into this sort of larger kind of community and, um, and to see themselves as someone who can, you know, if you have four to six hours or if you have eight hours or if you have two hours, um, that you can, you can offer your time and your experience and your workplace and give someone else a sense of what that, of what that work looks like. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, a, it's been a very interesting kind of uh, relationship. I mean, I, 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 I don't like to use the word failure of the education system. I come from a long line of teachers. I have to be careful. But um, I, I think some of the, the deficiencies are, and we've talked about this, the, the, uh, the access, uh, the students' awareness of why am I learning what I'm learning. I, if I knew how, why I needed to learn trig back in high school, I mean, I learned it because somebody said you have to you know, pass this course and get, 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 uh, get a good score on your SAT. Um, then I go out into the real world and I'm working in a community college and I'm learning how to run a CNC machine because I'm starting to do workforce development. Well, wow, look at there. There's you know, cosines and everything on, my, on the prints that they're trying to teach me to read. So we have to look at how do we start building that application, and not just for manufacturing, but as we're teaching our students the basics, the math, the reading, the English, why am I learning this, and where am I really going to apply this basic algebra and basic geometry? Um, there's uh, some examples of that. Uh, one of the National Network of Manufacturing Institutes uh, in Detroit, the one called LIFT, which is focused on lightweight uh, materials, um, they've uh, really started funding uh, in the five states that are part of the partnership some workforce development activities to just figure out how do we, again, continue to get more students open and aware of what are some of the, the new things going on in manufacturing. And a couple of the, the major things, uh, projects that they're funding, I think Kentucky is one of the leads for this, is some teacher education, and we're helping teachers develop lesson plans in math, science, and even you know English and, and reading where possible, um, where they work with a manufacturer and they can develop in sixth, seventh, eighth grade math and science classes, okay, I'm gonna teach you the basics of geometry and now we're gonna do a couple exercises where we're going to show you where this is applied. Uh, we piloted this when I was in Ohio. Um, we had an Alcoa engineer work with a teacher in the Cleveland Public Schools and they just, decided to, okay, we're going to create a few lesson plans, and the engineer comes into the classroom one day and brings out the Alcoa plant in Cleveland is making the wheel hubs for airplanes. He rolls one into the classroom. <laughs> Everyone just went, ooh. And very easily in a sixth and seventh grade math environment was able to explain what they're learning and how it applies to the role that he has as an engineer along with the technicians that are on the floor. So that's where we need to build that and teachers can't do it by themselves. So we're trying to figure out how to get more industry involved in helping those teachers create better lesson plans, do the plant tours mm -hmm. and, very, and, and very clearly show that link with what you're learning and here's how it's applied and whether you go into manufacturing or not, you better hope that somebody else is learning it because you're going to ride on that airplane someday. So, <laughs> but those are the kinds of things that our schools have to get better at. And we as the industry have to help them do that because they can't do it alone. I think, you know, I mentioned the STEM immersion before. I think I'm convinced every teacher that goes through that STEM immersion program in Charlotte, they're teaching different afterwards mm -hmm. because they know why they're teaching what they're teaching. Why, where it is applied, if, and if they can get that across to the students, I think they will learn a lot better. Uh, so there, there is a lot we, can, we need to do, and I think it goes back to, well, over, I don't know how long, everybody said, everybody has to get a four-year degree, everybody has to get a four-year degree. Well, if you get a four-year, if, you, if, you really, if your plan is to go to college, you don't necessarily at that point have to know what's going on afterwards. Unfortunately, you get a really bad awakening after college, or at least a lot of them, if they can figure out, oh, now I got a degree, and what am I going to do with this? 
there has to be a plan. And that's one of the things I always tell people. Don't just go. There's nothing wrong with college, but don't just go to college just to get a degree. You have to know what you want to do with it. And that's the same thing when we start apprentices. They have to be sure that's, that's really what they want to do. And it doesn't mean that an apprentice is going to stay and in that field or, or on the machine. I made an apprenticeship as a machinist. Obviously, I'm not out in the shop on the milling machine in the, the late anymore. There are plenty, plenty of opportunities out of it, but it gives a, a good base. And it's just that awareness, again, that they know. The students we are taking into the program, uh, I'm convinced each one of them could go through a four-year college. There's no question about it. They have the smarts. There's no doubt in my mind. But they don't necessarily want to sit in a school bench for four years. They like to work with their hands. And part of our evaluation is we try to find out what they do at their own time. And since we spend so much time during the, the recruiting with them, we, we learn a lot about them. And if they fix their cars at home, well, that's a good sign. That's just the first thing. And one of the things which is missing uh, in a lot of the schools is those hands-on classes. Woodworking or whatever was there, a lot of them disappeared. And so we have to slowly try to get them back so that we need people who work with their hands. We can't just mention some, sometimes we, just, we can't just uh, cut each other's hair. That's not going to get us anywhere. So we need to, we need to produce something. Well, I want to open it up to questions now if, uh, if, if you all have anything to ask. Yes? Someone's coming with a microphone. Hi, uh, my name is Shirin Köprüce, and I'm a global skills trainer and market entry consultant. Um, from my understanding uh, at the, with the first panel, as well as uh, from your discussions, I understand culture, actually, is a very important, um, important element in being motivated for the manufacturing industry, as well as developing productive um, development opportunities, such as the apprenticeship program, for instance. Um, so I was wondering... If you, um, if you have encountered cultural differences as you were introducing apprenticeship programs um, in, the, in your company as well as as a community leader and what the reactions of other panelists would be uh, with regards to that, that's one question. And the second question is where you fi found uh, points of connection with the American community, especially with American youth, um, I hope. They are not too com complex questions. Thank you. Well, I may start, start out with the first one. We clearly see differences uh, where, we are where our company is located. The closest high school is North Mecklenburg High School. Huge high school, I think 2,000 students or what or, or more. We basically get nobody out of there. And I think that's just a, a difference there because, OK, uh, Charlotte is the second largest banking center. And we are very close to Lake Norman. So a lot of the higher influence people are living in that area. And they don't necessarily want to send their kids into manufacturing. So it's very difficult for us to find. I'm convinced there are enough of them there that we could fill our program. But finding them is very, very difficult. We are more successful recruiting out in some more rural areas because we have one uh, apprentice right now, he's going to graduate in, uh, in August. He, I was at his home uh, about a year ago, and he's out in the boonies, let's say. And he fixes his car every weekend. He works on his car, or he just actually, he bought himself a house next to his parents' house, and he's adding an addition to it. He is constantly working on it. And obviously, in an in a, in a urban area, you can't do that. So there are clearly differences, and they're not the kids don't get exposed to it because there is no possibility. So there is a lot, a lot. We, we see a lot of a difference there, and yes, it has a lot to do also how it is promoted. If the school doesn't promote it, or in some cases we see differences. Some of our partner companies actually recruit out of South Carolina, and for whatever reason, okay, so. South Carolina is also more of a rural area in general anyway, but they get a lot more support from the schools than we get 
in Mecklenburg County. So, it, it, so we, we go outside of Mecklenburg County and I would say in, in our case, more than half of the students are not from Mecklenburg County where we are located. Anyone else want to answer? Well, culture is, it's a, it's a big word. And um, there's, in the manufacturing sector, especially small, mid-sized manufacturing companies, and, and a lot of my hands-on experience has been in the Midwest, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, doing consulting for those companies. Um, it, it is changing, finally, um, as ownership changes over, um, because some of the culture comes from the top, and it was a struggle getting younger, today's younger people, the Gen Y and millennials, to feel comfortable in the traditional manufacturing environment because many times the leadership in these small companies, oh, yeah, let's face it, they were still living in 1950, and um, they are starting to change as the generations of ownerships are changing. And now we have to re-advertise you know, re back into the culture that uh, it, there is a, 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 different, a different work opportunity and uh, millennials and, and young people today can feel comfortable in what looked like a traditional workplace, top-down, top-driven. Um, but as we become more productive and we look to engage our employees, which we have to do in a flattened organization, uh, leadership that is changing and accepting of the fact that just because somebody comes to me without a college degree doesn't mean that they can't think and that they can't be as, uh, as engaging and as supportive and, and really helpful to solving the problems of my workplace. Um, as that's happening, the culture in these organizations is changing and becoming more welcoming to the uh, younger worker of today who wants to come in and hit the ground running and isn't into that, I need to pay my dues and shut up for the next five years and take lots of orders until somebody asks me a question. Uh, we want our young people today to learn very quickly and become engaged in the, in the organization. But it's, and it's a slow change. As companies, leadership changes over, cultures are changing. But um, it, it, there's still the perception that manufacturing is a little bit more heavy-handed than other organizations. I saw a question over here. Yes. Hi, my name is Christian Ungarotti from the Embassy of Italy. Um, I have a question especially for Mr. Siegenthaler. I wanted to ask if you have any experience of this kind of system which you use for um, uh, apprenticeship uh, in high school and this very segment, uh, young segment of uh, students, also in the higher education. I mean, have you ever tried to implement this system combining in a systematic way work and theory for like position in management, uh, high engineering, uh, and so on? Well, obviously, manufacturing is not the only place for apprenticeships. And this is a manufacturing forum. That's why I'm mainly talking about manufacturing. But we're, we're in, not just in North Carolina, I mean, all over the United States, there is a push to get apprenticeships also into non-traditional areas. Um, there is an insurance company in Illinois that just started an apprenticeship program. And I'm working with some banks and try to get something going there. There are other possibilities. It doesn't have to be hands-on. Uh, if you look at what's done in Europe, everybody basically goes through an apprenticeship program. In Switzerland, 64% of the young adults who are finishing mandatory school are going into an apprenticeship program. But that can be as an uh, executive assistant, it can be as a dentist uh, or a dentist assistant, it can be as a salesperson in a store. It just, we have apprenticeship programs for everything. We have a long, long way to go till we get anywhere near that. But I think we, I, I really feel if we can expand it into some of those non-traditional areas, that's going to help the overall, because then people get a better understanding what an apprenticeship program is and that's going to make it easier also to find the ones who really want to get into manufacturing. But there is definitely, there's a lot of, of work to be done in that field, but it's starting to happen. There is a lot of effort, and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a big push since President Obama declared that he wanted to double the number of apprentices in five years. So there's a lot of activity from the Department of Labor and so on to get into those non-traditional areas because I think the number of potential students is much greater there. 
Uh, there's a question in the back. Thank you. My name is Kareem Shabaka. I'm with uh, Brown Solutions International. I really don't know where to start, so I wish you would help me out. The school, the school systems have failed, are failing. How much or how much do you plan to engage local governance or state governance uh, on the projects that you are doing to get more people involved or engaged, I'm talking about the students, in your operation? Number one, I see a lot of people going towards NBA. Uh, if you can sing and dance, you know, and flip a burger, yeah, you got, you got attraction. But I don't see t too much in apprenticeship programs. How engaged are you? What kind of resources are necessary to improve your engagement? And how can, <clears throat> would, you, would you say that I, as a, uh, as a uh, business person, can see the uh, uh, positiveness coming from your participation or engagement? Thank you. Um, I can, um, it's, it's a good question, and there's probably, uh, you know, we're a big country, and, and, and we behave fairly regionally and state-based um, in the way our, our businesses uh, it kind of co combine in, in our little communities. Um, an example of uh, starting to bring together resources is actually um, uh, something that was written up in Brookings uh, just last year uh, in Delaware. Uh, the Delaware MEP, which is the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, worked with the Delaware uh, Department of Higher Ed of, of Education, along with the Delaware Workforce System, which is our you know WIB Workforce Investment System, and created with the Delaware Manufacturers Association, brought companies together uh, and said, okay, we need to really look at a frontline manufacturing uh, kind of career certificate to get people started. So they defined with industry's input first, before the educators walked in the room, what is it that we really want students to learn? What do we need them to have? What does this look like from high school to perhaps uh, the first year of community college? And they designed that career pathway. Then they brought the educators in the room and said, okay, what do you have and what can we do to help you augment it, enhance it, customize it, and add to it? Uh, the educators said, okay, through our CTE program, career and technical education, vocational system, uh, we have a lot of this, but let's figure out how do we tweak it because industry was sitting there saying, you need to do this. The Department of Education said, we will support what changes you have to make. And the workforce system was saying, we'll figure out how to fund some of this too. So through all of that, we now have a state group of manufacturers who have agreed to a one or two year certificate from uh, one and two, the last two years, junior, senior year of community of vocational school, perhaps one year of community college, and students and parents can see where the break off points are. If I finish my last two years of vocational school, at the end I graduate as a senior, but I have a certificate that's recognized in the state, perhaps a national certificate, and the manufacturers in that state have said, we will look at you and give you perhaps, give you more preference because you have that certificate as we look to hire. But then the community college system said, we're gonna recognize what work you've done, so when you come to us, if you wanna enroll in the community college, we're gonna give you some credit for what you did in high school, which is, is happening in most states right now. There's dual enrollment, there's credit for experience. Everybody's looking at it differently. I wish we could have one system that looked at it the same. But we're all recognizing that we all have to work together. And that's just an example of, now Delaware's a small state. Right? How do you do that in Ohio and California? You almost have to do it county by county. But in a state, in a region, in a county, in an urban area, you need to bring everybody together and they need to listen and you need to have a strong facilitator, uh, whether it's the MEP or the Manufacturing Association, but everybody has to be able to, in a sense, compromise too and say, I'm willing to do something a little bit different and let's see if it works. I think there are several other areas too, like Colorado is another area where they really have a program starting. They, they got everybody involved, government is involved, uh, industry is, in, is involved, but I think no matter where you are, it needs to be industry-driven. That's the main thing, because 
we as, a, as manufacturers have to tell the educators what we need, and it needs to be driven. We can't just complain that we don't have the skilled labor and just sit there and wait for somebody to provide them. It's not going to happen. We need to get involved, and that's why we got involved 20 years ago. We said we couldn't find the people. That's why we said we need to do something. And I think that's really, uh, uh, industry has to realize they have to put some effort into it. It's, they, the schools are not going to give us the skilled labor we need to totally prepared. They're, that's just not going to happen. That does not work, we, not in, especially not in manufacturing. Yes, the school can help us to provide them, prepare them for what we have to teach them. And that's where we have to work together with the schools and everybody to really improve that. Yes. I have two questions. First, if you look at it at, on a national scale, you have these individual state efforts, but, but if you look at it at a national scale, how much is this taking hold in the US? Could you give us some sense of that and could you point us to some studies on this? Second point is what seems to be commonplace, Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Austria, uh, Denmark, all over, uh, with impressive numbers, as you cite, uh, somehow isn't working here, although 50 years ago it existed. W what are the key sort? There must be some resistance somewhere. And I, what is this resistance, and where does it come from? Well, where does it come from? That's a good question. <laughs> I think on why it went there, I think there was way too long. As I said, it was just everybody needs to get a four-year degree. If you want to get anywhere, you have to have a four-year degree. And that is not the case. I also feel that manufacturing uh, made some mistakes. Um, that's, you know, looking at North Carolina, big part of manufacturing was textile. That was really the manufacturing we had. And it's all gone. I'm not saying we could have avoided everything, but I think if, if textile at that time would have done more about educating young people and invest into their business, get more modernized and so on, I think we would have a different picture today. But that's what we are struggling with in North Carolina right now because a lot of the parents lost their jobs in textile. Well, they say, I don't want to send my kid into manufacturing. Look what happened to me. That's just going to disappear somewhere again. So it is difficult to say, okay, where did it come from? That's a trend which, which built. On the other hand, I have to say, uh, looking at nationwide, I think we have uh, really all over, I think we, ha we have activities all over the place. So USDOL generated that program, Apprenticeship USA Leaders, and we, we as that valor are one of them, and we have a commitment to promote apprenticeships. That's our commitment. And after a year, they check and say, hey, what have you done? So, and there are, we had a meeting here in Washington uh, last year, we, there were over 100 of those apprenticeship leaders here. So there is, there is activity, and being involved for 20 years in, in apprenticeships here in the US, I have never seen as much activity as over the last two, three years. It's definitely taking on, but we have a long way to go. We cannot, this, this is a big ship to turn around. That we can't do that in one or two years. It's going to take a lot of time. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Chi Hang from Xinhua News Agency. Uh, I will follow that first question is that uh, you said in the last two or three years, uh, the apprenticeship is a uh, uh, kind of booming in the US. So why this? why it becomes popular in the last two or three years. And my second question is related to that, is that uh, now in the media, we usually talk about the recovery of the U.S. manufacturer or the return of U.S. manufacturer. But some will argue that uh, uh, because of the technology uh, improvement, although the U.S. Uh, manufacturer has recovered uh, a lot, but it imp employed less people. So is this... Uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, apprenticeship becomes uh, more popular because the manufacturer is booming, but it requ the requirement for its employees is, has also been raised. Thank you very much. I'm to the, 
Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. To the first question, I wouldn't say that apprenticeships are booming yet. <laughs> it's being talked a lot more about it. But that doesn't mean that it really, that apprenticeships are booming. There's a lot of talk. Now we have to also turn the talk into action. Uh, and then, of course, on the manufacturing end of it, today's manufacturing is different than what, what we had 20, 30 years ago. Everything is a lot more automated. Even if we get the same amount of manufacturing output, we are never going to be needing as many people anymore as we used to. But the people we need have to have higher skills. And that's where the difference is. It's as I said the employment number is not going to go back to where it was. But the higher skills are, there is higher skills needed, so therefore education is more important. You can't just take the people from the road and uh, from the street and put them on a CNC milling machine. That just doesn't work. Yeah, it, it, in manufacturing workforce is has you know in numbers gone down as productivity has increased tremendously. Some of that has just been higher skilled workers and a lot of this through the, uh, the opportunity of new technologies. And, but there, the, the, uh, the, you know, some of the, the words out there about the still big need for the manufacturing workforce is we all probably know that there was some periods over the last you know, 20 years of uh, decreasing. And when companies were not hiring as many people, the people that they had stayed on, and so now you have an aging workforce. Uh, so the big need, when you hear the big numbers of manufacturers across the country, we're expecting you know, that there's going to be millions of jobs that could potentially go unfilled. It's not increase in headcount, it's replacement headcount. And I would say probably 60, 70% of that number is replacement headcount, and most plant managers today are losing a lot of sleep about what are they going to do. Some of that was augmented or pushed back back in 2008, 2009, the recession. People who may have retired at 55, 60 stayed on because their retirement funds crashed. So now we're back up to you know, good productivity. Everybody's uh, uh, 401ks are back up to speed. And those are 65-year-olds 65, you know, 65 are now saying, OK, I'm out of here. Um, I'm getting ready to leave. And boo on a lot of small companies, they didn't plan for this right. So they're struggling with finding that skilled workforce. Those are the people that are leaving and taking lots of talent with them. And we don't have a whole lot of people in the middle. So now we have to bring in a lot of young people. So the, the value of an apprenticeship or some very strong structured on-the-job training program is becoming much more aware in the minds of manufacturers today because they don't have anybody in the middle. They really have to rely on Joe, who's going to retire, and hope that he's going to stick around long enough to train Susie, who's coming in off the street, who's never worked in a manufacturing plant. So it, it, it's a challenge. And apprenticeship is one of the potential answers, a, a good structured apprenticeship. Yes, sir? Thank you. My name is Pete Shutley. I'm retired from Brookings. My question is workforce development. When a major globally known manufacturing company moves to some of the southern, more rural states, I'm thinking of Mercedes going to Alabama or BMW going to South Carolina, Boeing going to South Carolina. And so my question is, what do they do with the state to get that trained workforce? Do they say to the state, we will move there if you train this many people and have them available, or the school should train this many people and once you have them, we'll move there, or what's the secret behind them getting a manufacturing skilled workforce out of a formerly rural area? I, it, it's sometimes it's a, it's, it's a meeting of the minds. Many of those states uh, are saying that before the company says it. They're the, the, the states, the southern states, I will say, and I grew up in manufacturing states of the Midwest, um, have uh, more centralized systems. So when the state says, come here, we're going to figure it out, they can figure it out a lot faster because they have more... I don't want to use the word control, but the centralization of the education and the workforce system um, is there so that one person at the state level really can say, we're going to make this work no matter where you move in our state, 
because we can create some more seamless and uh, similar programs across the state. And that, that is what it is. It, it's, let's face it, that's why companies move from one state to another, because there's some incentive on the table. Um, is there, was there a bigger workforce already trained in South Carolina or Alabama? No. But the states were uh, more interested in trying to make sure that that happened. Are they struggling? It's still a struggle. For example, Volkswagen in Chattanooga, Tennessee, they have the Volkswagen, uh, what do they call it, academy. So they really train it, have a big apprenticeship program. They're training their people because the state is not going to provide them. The pro state probably invests some money mm -hmm. into it, but it's, it's always teamwork. They have to work together. And yes, in Alabama, I don't think that uh, they just found a workforce which is totally ready for it. On the other hand, I also have to say a lot of the jobs in automo automotive manufacturing can be trained because they're repetitive. Mm -hmm. We are a very small manufacturing. We are, we are manufacturing custom designed equipment. Mm -hmm. Well, what we built today, we may never build again. And what we did yesterday doesn't help us today. So we need a lot more skills. So it, and yes, there is a lot of support companies around an automotive manufacturer, which also they need skills. So, but I don't think there is a state out there that just has all the skills available which are needed. It's, I think it's more, it's the workforce even there. That's the first point, because you have to have enough people. If you, have a, 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 if you put up a Mercedes plant, you have to have a lot of people. And, but then you have to do training. And they start training way before they start production. Otherwise, it's, they're, they're not going to be ready. I think we have time for one last question in the back. Uh, Ken Jarber from NEA again. In all this discussion about getting students hands-on experience, nobody has mentioned the words maker movement. How does the maker movement fit into uh, getting young people, A, excited about manufacturing, and B, get them the skills they need to then go into manufacturing? I mean, I think you've said it. <laughs> yeah. You know, the maker movement is a huge impetus for manufacturing, and it's been a great, in many ways, kind of grassroots effort um, to have people have, you know, whether it's kind of a DIY home tinkerer or whether it's, you know, the high school shop teacher who suddenly has kind of a new way of talking about or seeing their work. The maker movement becomes a huge component of this work. So it's I'm I'm. I'm so glad you brought it up when we think about things like you know, alternative educational models like a hackathon or a boot camp, something like you know, the maker movement, you know, the, particularly the kind of research that's coming out of someplace like Indiana University where they're particularly sort of supporting and talking about what those skills are, textbooks, all of those ways that um, the maker movement is, is also really being um, kind of codified uh, has, has, I think, made it a huge, a huge effort. And then also that you have something, you know, like a national magazine like Make, you know, that's coming out that gives that gives people, um, you know, kind of hands-on activities and and a point of entry into this work is is huge. And if people aren't familiar with the maker movement, if you haven't haven't been to a maker fair, um, you know, that's my homework assignment to you is mm -hmm. to create one in your town or to go to go to a maker fair. They're fascinating. They're really they're really inspiring and and also interesting. There's a lot of you know, research about um, how inclusive and, you know, some of these, some of the maker communities are, but I still think it's a great and really interesting um, and, and hopeful kind of, you know, homegrown effort that's really, you're really seeing also a lot of small companies, you know, whether it's Little Bits or, um, you know, Adafruit or, you know, other small companies that are also sort of building and taking the, the maker movement into interesting online spaces as well. So I think that's all the time we have. Um, I want to thank our panelists for joining us today. And thank you.